Hi guys, it's me, Mrs. Bennett. It's about 8.30 at night, um, on Tuesday night, and I'm sitting here on my couch um, planning on um, spending the next, oh, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 minutes with you, walking you through some things that I think will help you as you work on uh, understanding your literary analysis score and also planning um, the revision process. So um, I know that in a perfect world, I would have an opportunity to sit and talk to each of you individually every single time we wrote. Um, so I could go through and point out exactly where in your essay um, you are doing a good job and where in your essay you may want to look to revise. But you know that that's just not, not altogether feasible. So this is what I thought I'd do. I'd create this slideshow and then kind of talk you through um, what my thoughts are in terms of how I score and what I look for. And then maybe, you know, in a perfect world, you would start kind of thinking like me and then um, you would be able um, to find a whole lot of success even when we are in sort of a time crunch. So you're looking at the agenda, and I'm gonna go through each of these six parts with you. Um, if at any time my dogs bark, um, I apologize in advance. It's likely that that happens. Um, so try not to freak out when you hear them. They're actually laying here next to me right now. All right, so we're gonna start by looking at some specifics from your literary analysis scoring tool. So if you happen to have that in your binder, I would pull it out right now because I'm gonna, I, I copied and pasted some of it into slides. Um, most of us scored um, in the three or four, five or six or seven range. Um, even if you're scoring twos, uh, that's probably not happening all the time, so you might want to kind of take a look at typically what you score. I think it's really about time you start making a real conscious effort to pay attention to what you're scoring and why, um, not just look passively at your score and move on. Um, if you're scoring high, like typically eights and nines, um, that's pretty awesome. Just make sure that you know what you're doing to stay up there. Um, okay, so then we're going to move into organization and talk specifically about thesis statements and assertions. Um, then, of course, text evidence and analysis. So three and four, we'll be talking about chunks. Um, and then I am going to give you um, a quick rundown on conclusions and, um, and then maybe talk to you a little bit about how to create a level of sophistication. So here's the thing, you guys. I've talked to you about all of this stuff for the last, oh, I don't know, for most of you, it's been almost two years. But maybe if we have this video, you can go back to it and, re and listen <clears throat> and look at certain parts of it over and over again until you, you're really clear as to um, what it is that you're kind of supposed to be doing when you write. Um, okay, so let's get started. Super fast, the nines and eights, this is what they do, and this is copied and pasted right from your scoring tool. If you get a grade back, a score back on a paper, and you don't look at this page, I can't fathom how you think you're going to change um, uh, what you're doing or even maintain what you're doing well. So real fast with me, look at what nines and eights do. Um, they're characterized by a persuasive analysis. Um, they offer a range of interpretations, convincing readings of both complex meanings of the abstract and concrete parts of the prompt. So that's really heavy. That means you're not only doing what you're supposed to be doing and analyzing the abstract and concrete parts of the prompt, but you're offering really kind of insightful and complex meanings for how the concrete contributes to the abstract. We call that perceptive analysis. And you've heard me say clear and sophisticated. And we can talk a little bit more about how we make that happen. All right, super fast. Sevens and sixes. 
This is where we should be aiming. If you're writing a six, aim to get on the high level here. So aim to get to be the seven. Um, do that before you start aiming for nines. It's just a little bit more feasible. All right, these essays offer a reasonable analysis of the author's language. Um, and um, they're kind of attempting to develop complex meanings, which is, which is awesome. That's a really great starting point. Um, what you need to know is that sevens and eights are less thorough. You know what that means? That means you need to write more. Um, keep asking yourself, well, how did that happen? Or what does that mean? And then answer the question. Um, these essays are oftentimes less precise. That means the diction isn't as clear. I'm going to show you some examples of that today uh, here in the next couple of slides. Um, and your discussion of the depth of the abstract part of the prompt and the concrete language um, probably is less precise there too. Um, I think the biggest part of sevens and sixes, and I know a bunch of you got sixes, so look closely at this last part, um, your analysis of the relationship between the concrete and the abstract is less convincing. So that's something to keep in mind. I think we talked about this last year as ninth graders. It probably didn't make as much sense to you. But now that you're actually able to look at chunks of your analysis, you can probably sense where you aren't really talking about how the concrete contributes to the abstract. I'm going to show you a sample here in a minute. Fives. This is a lot. I'm not going to read it all to you the way I just did with the sixes and sevens, but here's what you should know. Fives do what they should be doing, um, but in a very superficial way. That means you just touch on meaning, but you don't really get into how meaning is created. Um, this second part here says the analysis of the abstract or of the concrete may be vague, even formulaic. If you're still working through the template, you're probably scoring fives. Um, and you might be sort of minimally supported by references to the text. That means you give me a text, evidence, you give me a quote, but you don't tell me which part of the quote contributes to your next thought. Sometimes fives even minorly misinterpret parts of the text. So you'll see me on your paper say, mm, not sure I agree with this image. Um, that would be like a minor misinterpretation. Last part, important. These essays demonstrate some control of language, but might be marred by surface errors. So those of you who aren't employing commas when you should, or you're misspelling like the author's name, or mispunctuating um, using apostrophes, or even such little things like titles, this is these are surface areas, and they add up, and you won't ever get higher than a five if your essay has you know three or four or six of them. Okay. Um, Okay, next. So fours and threes. These are our lower half essays. They fail to offer an adequate analysis. This means that you might have half of an analysis. They're, it's partial. Maybe you talk a lot about the concrete, but not at all about the abstract. Maybe you're talking all about the abstract Dickens feelings, but you're not telling me what the language does to support it. Um, they might be, these papers are sometimes unconvincing. You tell me something and I go, that doesn't naturally make sense to me. Hey, so the repetition um, um, highlights Dickens' hatred towards the revolution. Well, no. I mean, how am I supposed to make sense of that? You have to tell me how one contributes to the other. Um, and then you can kind of look through this, if you get to the bottom here, the writing is often um, inadequate in development. So that means you're missing text references in paragraphs, or, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe your uh, analysis is a sentence or two, and, and you didn't get a chance to talk yourself into doing what you were supposed to be doing. Um, a lot of times that's where our threes come from. Okay, so... 
here's what I want to do. I didn't even get a, I, I didn't want to go into twos. I mean, you can look at your scoring tool for that. Let's talk about thesis statements now. So this is a big deal for you guys on this particular paper. Um, so when I read your thesis statement, I'm looking that you have two concrete references in terms of the plot and two abstract. And then I want to see that you are giving me a purpose because if you tell me why the author does what he does, then it gives you something more to talk about in your analysis without being redundant. You've heard me say that before. Here's an example of a, of a thesis statement. Recognition, I'm sorry, this is actually the whole introduction, so you're going to hear the universal truth too, but let's look specifically at the thesis statement. Recognition of fatal flaws in a system is the very beginning of riddling it with its problems. In Charles Dickens' cautionary tale, A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens' penetrating perspective toward the coming revolution is communicated through an insightful series of poignant and quick shifting tonality. So it sounds pretty fancy, right? Um, but I think that what you'll feel is, is right away you have to stop for a minute and think. Like there's nothing in this thesis statement that tells me sort of what's happening in the passage. I don't get anything clear. It's sort of like a passive reference to the task. Um, and so let's see upon reflection if we have all of the parts we need. So I'd have to say that we have a limiting and even vague uh, concrete reference or two here. Um, specifically, this student is saying concretely that we're going to have um, through insightful series of we're going to have poignant and quick shifting tonality. Um, okay, so all you're talking about is shifting tones. It, it's not telling me what those tones are and it's very vague this could go with any piece of literature anywhere. It's not specific to the passage. Um, are there two concrete references there? Yeah. Um, are they actually addressing the task? Very, very um, vaguely. So let's look at now the abstract part. So this is the abstract part. Um, Dickens' penetrating perspective. So remember, you guys, the abstract part of the question was, to analyze Dickens' attitude or feelings about the coming revolution. So he has a penetrating perspective. What does that mean? Um, essentially, there are no true abstract assertions in this thesis. Um, there's one passive reference to just the fact that Dickens has an attitude about the revolution, um, but not asserting what that attitude is. And then I don't really have a, a, a purpose at all. Um, so here, here's what we have. We have a thesis statement. We have an introduction that has a universal truth. It has a tag. Um, the language might be a little difficult to understand, but it's there. It has two references to the concrete, and it has an abstract, but none of which is really the controlling idea for the essay, which is what a thesis statement does. So let's look at what we would score this. Um, I would say that this particular um, reference should probably be in the four to three range. Um, I think that quite possibly um, this lack of, it, it, or there's an inadequate development of ideas. The focus is unclear and it seems unconvincing or even partial. There's definitely um, some truth to this, that this thesis ignores the complexity of meaning attributed to both the abstract and concrete part. So that's kind of where we are with that. Um, let's look now at another thesis. Um, without death, there would be no life. In Charles Dickens' cautionary tale, A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens' portrayal of the hope that Madame Defarge installs into the people, knitting, 
and the ominousness of Saint Antoine pre-revolution highlights Dickens' view that the chaos of the revolution will restore the purpose of living for the people of Saint Antoine. Okay, so upon reflection, we have clear, concrete references. We have the portrayal of hope given or instilled um, by Madame Defarge into the people. And number two, we have the ominousness of Saint Antoine. We also have a clear reference to the abstract idea that Dickens believed, quote, or the chaos of the revolution would restore the purpose of living for the people of Saint Antoine. So alert, there's really only one abstract reference here and it may leave the analysis in the body paragraphs kind of repeating itself if the analysis is attempting to stay on thesis. Um, that's the hesitation for me. Um, is there a separate purpose? No, but when you look at it or listen to the to the thesis read, it sounds like the abstract reference is actually doing double duty. It alludes to a purpose nicely. So that's pretty awesome. Let's look at the score. I give this, this is on the road for a seven. Um, and I would say the only thing holding it back from the eight and nine, the high level would be that the language is less precise. Um, that's it. It definitely does uh, uh, more than a reasonable analysis, which is why I would call it aiming towards a seven rather than a six. Um, and we have all of the all of the parts in terms of the abstract and the concrete part. Okay, so let me move on. Um, now we are at assertion. So let's take a look at this assertion. Oh my gosh, you guys, I cannot believe how many papers actually did not have assertions. They just started either with a topic sentence like, Madame Defarge is a crazy person. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with the prompt. Nothing to do with the prompt. Or people started talking about the tone and then they went right into a... Um, a, a piece of text evidence. Look at your paper right now and look to see that you had assertions. And then look to see that your assertions do what we're going to talk about here. It must not be topic or a summary of the text. So that means that your assertion should address what Dickens does. Check to see that it mentions a concrete and an abstract reference from your thesis. I know this is crazy, but I actually do this. My eyes will look at the first sentence in your paragraph and I, my brain highlights your concrete and then highlights your abstract reference. And then my eyes shoot up to your thesis to see if your concrete and your abstract are going with your thesis. Um, not only do I score that way, but I write that way. I mean, I physically in my brain when I'm writing highlight my words in my brain with the colors of concrete and abstract because I'm so color driven. Um, okay, so let's listen to this assertion. By portraying the idea of the coming revolution with menial subjective behavior, the author effectively demeans the idea of a revolt through his illustration of the concept as simple-minded. So it very obviously is addressing what Dickens is doing, right? It very obviously is addressing, he's portraying an idea, um, the idea of the revolution, and he's doing that um, by illustrating, you know, these, um, this simple mindedness, um, through these, uh, menial and subjective behaviors. And so right away, because I've read the passage, I'm like, oh yeah, I know, like we've got this knitting going on, right? So I absolutely know that there are these kind of menial behaviors and, and I like it. I think it's onto something. Um, let's look at the reflection. 
So their concrete references are notable, menial and subjective behavior, and also simple-minded. It's awesome. There are two definitely, def, uh, there, there are multiple references to the concrete there. Abstract references are notable too. Dickens, quote, demeans the idea of a revolt. If we had to score it, I'm telling you we are in six or seven range again. Um, this particular assertion um, is is reasonable and it is developing complex meanings that the author is is attempting to to suggest. Um, you know, why is it not an eight? It's just a little bit um, Let me see if I can find it again. Sorry. It's a little bit, um, um, you know, like all over the place. Okay, so I'll tell you. By portraying the idea of the coming revolution with menial subjective behavior, you know, I think if this person would have inserted some context here, it would have been less... Um, ambiguous and maybe more clear. Gosh, that could have been all that it took to get that to the eight. Um, maybe say, Madame Defarge, you can do that in your assertion. Um, you can give me some context specifically. Heck, you can do that in your thesis. Um, so there were some awesome things that went on there. Um, now, let's see if this person can analyze this assertion as, as, um, at, at such a high level. So this is the analysis of that assertion. Let's look for concrete references that align with the assertion. So here we're looking for menial and subjective behavior and uh, a clear analysis of the devices given. Um, also, we should look to see that the language is tied to the abstract reference. Um, here, Dickens' degradation of the idea of revolution. So let's read the analysis. As the author comments on the inevitability of the coming revolution. Huh, that's interesting. So there was nothing in the assertion about this notion that the revolution was inevitable. So I don't know if that is making me question the validity of the assertion. Um, but there's something that I would have, I, I would have read this and stopped and thought to myself, huh, and the idea is not to give me any cause for pause, actually. Um, so let's continue. Um, as the author comments on the inevitability of the coming revolution, he begins to narrate on the knitting of the women of France and how so much was closing in about the women who sat knitting, knitting, that their very selves were closing in around a structure yet unbuilt where they were to sit knitting, knitting, dropping heads. So my instinct is that that text is just way too long. It's not quoting the most quotable part. Um, boy, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but that's the problem, is that there are so many devices in here that one could talk about that um, it's, it's leading me to believe that we're going to talk about the symbolism of the structure. We're going to talk about the repetition of knitting. We're going to talk about... Um, this closing in, um, because it's repeated as well. So the imagery of that. There's so much, the dropping heads, um, which is, you know, there's an, a, a, a syntactically this ellipsis here. And, um, and my goodness, there's so much to talk about. And it, it looks to me that there are only about four lines worth of analysis that this student probably would have been better served just picking the one thing he or she is going to talk about in terms of the concrete. So throughout the novel, knitting is an illustration weaving the knots of the revolution together. So very poetic um, 
sounds a little bit like we're getting at symbolism. Um, though, I'm sorry, through the repetition of the concept, meaning of knitting, uh, good concrete, Dickens' derogatory referencing to the revolution conveys his belief that it is simple and destined for ultimate failure. So, boy, you can tell that this person is doing exactly what he or she is, I'm sorry, supposed to be doing. Um, good job embedding the text, although there seems to be too much of it to analyze. Concrete reference is to repetition, and subtly to symbolism, we understand, the symbolism we understand is associated with knitting. Um, however, alert, there is no discussion of how the devices work. Um, yeah, boom, just went from a seven to a five. So that's, that's tough. I mean, you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, and then all of a sudden, if you don't talk about how the language works, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to the five. So that's tough. Um, abstract reference to the simplicity mentioned in the assertion. Um, check this out, you guys. Alert. I actually have no clue how I'm supposed to understand that repetition contributes to the belief that revolution is simple. Okay, hear me on this. It's not the repetition that does that. It's the simple task of knitting. So I know this student wanted me to think about knitting as like what grandmas do, right? Like it's this simple, mundane task that happens without thought. And so that somehow parallels the simplicity of... Um, you know, the, the revel, I don't, you know, I don't know. That would have worked, but repetition doesn't by definition do that. Now, had the student defined repetition for me or for himself, uh, then it's likely that um, that would have been made understood. So it's doing everything it's supposed to be doing. Um, it's just not complete and thorough. And there is actually a partial analysis of the concrete because we don't know what the device is doing by definition. And so therefore we have a five. Okay, so let's look at a strong chunk. So instead of making you read a student's handwriting, I went ahead and typed it. So this is a student that... Um, was, um, she, this is actually her work, so she's probably going to recognize it when we start to read it. Um, okay, Dickens describes Madame Defarge in the evening to have her work in her hand as she would pass from place to place and from group to group. The eagerness reveals the power she holds over the people of the revolution as she passes on from each group, motivating them that their oppression and poverty instituted by the nobility can be relinquished. The alliteration creates a rhythm that highlights Dickens' own eagerness to have a revolution that is necessary for life worth living again. So some of the things that we commented on about the last chunk was one of the things we commented on was that there was so much text. Here we have um, the most quotable part, simply passing from place to place and from group to group. Um, the concrete reference is to alliteration. Um, there's obvious uh, a repetition here. My hesitation for this particular chunk um, was that it, um, it, it feels as if the most poignant part of that text is the repetition, although there is lovely alliteration, especially with the alliterative P. Um, so I don't know. It's, I'm, I, it's, it's right, but I'm not sure that it's the most thorough and poignant part of the device. 
Um, but it's definitely doing what it's supposed to be doing. Yippee! So this is the stuff of sixes right here. Um, the abstract reference to Dickens' eagerness for revolution is tied, although weakly, in a weak way, um, to the concrete reference mentioned above. So the abstract reference is that Dickens' own eagerness to have revolution is somehow highlighted through the rhythm created by the alliteration. Um, again, I, I, I marked it in red so that you could see it easily. Um, I feel like that's passively done, and that's why this analysis couldn't score over a six. So um, it definitely a more thorough job than a five, but not quite at the level of even the higher seven or the eights or nines. Okay, let's talk about conclusions. This is everybody's favorite, or um, most, maybe not favorite, but it's the, it's the most popular topic of conversation in tutoring and um, in emails and, and text messages to me. So you are, um, I guess, ready for a, a clear discussion on conclusions. So uh, this is a perfect world. Um, is it a perfect conclusion? No. Um, but in terms of what is included in the conclusion, um, and we're going to do double duty here. We're going to actually talk about conclusions, and I'm also going to have a quick conversation with you about how to create sophistication. So I actually wrote this. And again, it's not perfect, um, kind of brain dead, but I, I, was, I was actually trying to show you a, a complete conclusion, and I was also trying to incorporate some language of a sophisticated literary analysis. So bear with me. Okay. We have a recap in red. We're going to have our tag and our thesis again in black. And this is my thesis for actually wrote this paper um, uh, timed writing two years ago with my students. And this was my thesis from that paper. And then um, a universal truth uh, at the end, actually. So it's kind of the inversion of what we do in an intro. Tag thesis and then close with a universal truth. You want your last thought to be sort of lingering in the minds of the greater, like you're, you're attempting to, to change their ideas about something or, or, you know, just the last taste they have in their mouth after reading your paper is this lesson about life, which we know is a universal truth. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but it's, it's, it's really, it can be really impactful. Um, I was talking to some graders uh, some people that um, uh, are a, a part of the AP Lit um, grade every year, and they said that there are always occasions when a conclusion will actually bring a paper up an entire score point. And I don't tell you guys that because I'm afraid you're going to bail out of your analysis early and go on to your conclusion um, in an attempt to beef up your score, um, I don't want that, but I do think that that's kind of a cool thing to keep in the back of your mind as you're writing. Okay, so here we go. Here is um, my conclusion to my, my paper. There is a true sense of the strength of the oppressed in Dickens' work. This is seen not only in Madame Defarge and her deliberate and focused band of knitting women, but also it is heard in the simple sounds of struggle and desperation in a polis broken, hungry, ground down. In Charles Dickens' fictional novel, A Tale of Two Cities, the strength, yet at times maniacal determination of these oppressed people parallel Dickens' own attitudes that revolution may draw to it the strong, but the draw will be at the cost of their humanity. Although the polis and its people are willing, war is dire. The dire nature of war should will the strong toward life, not loss. Okay, so um, you can go back and read that kind of on your own time, just to sort of see, but you see the part in red here is 
is, is a recap. It's sort of like a quick summary of essentially what I talked about in my paper. And, um, and I'm talking about Dickens, and I'm talking about Madame Defarge, and I'm, and I'm being a little bit colloquial when I say the band of knitting women, you know, because I kind of think of her as like a, uh, thinking of herself as kind of this Robin Hood character with his band of merry men. So I was trying to sort of allude to that there. Um, and then you can tell that I was in my paper talking, uh, going to talk about imagery. Um, so I sort of mentioned it here. Um, and, and just the struggle of, of the oppressed people. So, um, then you have my thesis and, um, these would be my concrete that we have a strength of people that I'm going to talk about, and then we're going to have this um, a, a similar strength, but it's moved now to maniacal indetermination. So that's um, like like the determination of a maniac, right? So um, those are my two concretes, and um, and then my idea about the abstract is that Dickens um, believes not only that revolution the notion of revolution draws to it the strong willed, but that that very draw will be at the cost of their demise, essentially their loss of life, sure, but more importantly, their loss of humanity, because, you know, I'm a humanities teacher, so that's kind of always at the forefront. And then here was my, my universal truth, this notion that, you know, um, um, the people are willing to go to war, and war is is like horrible. Um, the truth, though, is that their willingness should essentially be redirected towards um, bringing more life, not causing more loss. So this is kind of my theory. Um, what what I'm sure you can see that I've done is I've been hyper vigilant about employing advanced syntax all throughout the conclusion, um, because I know that that's what Dickens does in his work. I'm trying to mimic that in my writing as a way of hinting to the author that besides just the prompt, I understand what Dickens' language does as a whole. Um, so we can go back and look at, um, you know, obviously my illusion there, the band, the band of Barry went men, the band of knitting women. Um, and then I start here. If I'm talking about sound imagery, um, if I'm going to, I like to employ it. So I'm using the alliterative S simple sounds of struggle. And then even the consonants of the S and the desperation and the polis. Um, that soft S is just really powerful in terms of, um, 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 it, it parallels an emotional plight. So when you, it, it's a rhetorical strategy actually. So when you're trying to get somebody to think about something horrifying or emotionally straining or drawing, um, it's sometimes really clever to employ that soft alliterative sound um, because it has um, emotional appeal to it. Um, and then of course you see the ascendatin, the polis broken, hungry, ground down. So I avoided up uh, um, any conjunctions there. Um, I guess we can look really quickly. I already talked about the thesis, I guess. So I, I super fast at the universal truth. Um, although the polis and its people are willing, <clears throat> war is dire. So we've have the alliterative W. But now watch the anadiplosis. The dire nature of war should will. So I ha actually had will A, war B, dire C. And now I'm going to go C, war B, will A. So it's that mirroring of anadiplosis that I attempted to employ there. So there's a conclusion. Um, at the very least, um, recap, tag and thesis, universal truth. If you don't have time for all of that, then this is 
the the tag and thesis and the universal truth should be, you know, a part of it. And and you may not have time to do the recap. I understand, but um, that's a that's a pretty strong conclusion. Um, and I think I covered, you know, my thoughts about sophistication as well. You guys also know that I think including context throughout your essay and in, in, when you embed your text is really another nice way to, to deliver a clarity um, of prose, which I think denotes a higher scoring essay. Um, okay, so I'm sorry that was so long. I'm sure you've fast forwarded me or paused me. Um, I hope that while you go through this and listen to me talk about these examples, that you are actually also stopping and looking at your own paper. Remember that reading your own chunks out loud to somebody else is an incredibly powerful way to identify if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Sitting passively by just waiting for me to point out what's wrong, um, not your best plan at this point. So I need you to be really actively trying to discern what qualifies an eight or a nine or sophistication or a lack thereof. Um, Mrs. Bennett loves you. Until next time, thanks for listening.